Imagine, demand and build a world transformed. So without further ado, I'm going to start off um, by handing over to Rob. So Rob, you've got, got five minutes. Tell us about um, music industries, small venues and, and beyond London as well. All right, thanks for that introduction. And uh, thanks to Avant TBT, it's been keeping me sane during this crazy time. So um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, yeah, I'm Rob. I'm a musician and a courier in London. And uh, as, uh, as many of you will probably guess, the music industry has been decimated during this pandemic and um, will continue to be, um, <coughs> sorry, once we deal with the economic crisis that follows, um, there's an estimated 200,000 people who work in the music industry, um, not only just musicians, but people working in the venues as well. And um, a lot of these people, including musicians, have been left with absolutely no support. Uh, venues closed, tours were halted, and gigs and projects were put um, on hold as well. I had some work booked in all the way to Christmas, and within two days, Several emails later, it was all cancelled and now tentatively penciled in for New Year, but we'll see what happens there. Um, according to UK Music, 72% of those who are working in the music industry are self-employed and often, um, is bogus self-employed, you're often there doing a lot of work and you should be employed, but you're not. And then you don't get the rights that you deserve. Um, this means the furlough scheme didn't apply to a lot of people working in the music industry. So many had to go through universal credit, which is long-winded and arduous, as many of you probably can attest to. Um, it means a lot of musicians were left basically with no income. Uh, maybe they had some streaming income, but I mean, streaming, you know, it's pittance. Most of it goes up to the record label. Uh, Sony makes about 600 grand an hour from streaming services alone. Um, so a lot of musicians just were left with streaming. And a lot of musicians anyway, before this, uh, myself included, relied on other jobs and the default seems to be zero hours for these things. Um, these jobs were often affected, so I'm a courier as well. And the courier industry was, was um, screwed as well because a lot, of, a lot of restaurants and things were closing down as well. So this uh, job that people usually did as a side hustle now became their primary source of income and a lot of people couldn't work. And this left, uh, you know, it was quite saturated. Uh, market now because loads of people were just coming into it because they, they they were they had to uh, find some money obviously um, I'll speak a bit about venues because I'm involved in a venue in Deptford um, and obviously music venues are just as screwed as everyone who likes to frequent them um, I help run a venue in Deptford called Matchstick Pie House we are an artist led volunteer run space that opened in uh, 2018. And obviously, uh, when venues had to close back in May, I think it was, obviously we had to close our doors and uh, kind of left in the in limbo there. Um, a lot of kind of bigger venues and arenas might be able to weather the storm, but a lot of smaller venues are in serious peril. Um, Mark David from the Music Venues Trust, who've supported us quite a lot, um, that represents almost 700 grassroots venues he said of those 114 described themselves as relatively secure for the next eight weeks and this was when they closed um, which leaves 556 under threat of imminent closure so that's 83 percent of the entire grassroots sector um, is under threat of closing and in a tale as old as time comrades the main problem is rent um, this is coupled with um, the small grants that were people were eligible for. Um, if you if your business was valued under fifty one grand, you could access a small grant. But for a lot of venues in major cities, not just London but Manchester and Liverpool, that have huge scenes of, them, of their own, a lot of those businesses were actually valued over fifty one thousand pounds, so they weren't eligible for any of the support schemes. Um, according to the Music Venues Trust as well, um, two hundred venues did apply for the coronavirus business interruption scheme. And so far, none of those have been successful. Apparently they couldn't persuade um, the people who they needed to persuade, whether it's the banks or the government, that, uh, that they are a viable risk that needs supporting. So um, 
we at the Pie House, with a lot of other businesses in the area, in Deptford, South East London, came together and uh, negotiated a rent freeze with the Arch Company, who, who we rent from, um, which is amazing. Um, it's kept a lot of businesses open, not just music venues, but cafes, businesses, MOT, garages, all everything that makes Deptford what it is. Um, the only problem with this is, as soon as the Arch Company start asking for, for rent again, a lot of these places, including music venues, uh, might not be able to weather that because uh, we're opening in a few weeks, we're opening a, a, a small part of the with two railway arches, we're opening one railway arch and we're going to be capping it at like 30 people, which is kind of enough to break even, but a lot of small venues um, can't, can't, can't social distance. Um, Sister Midnight in Deptford, amazing venue, they've got 50 cap, they're not going to be able to social distance. Um, so a lot of venues now, in theory, can reopen, but they can't do safely. So um, what is to be done? Um, I guess that's why we're here today, right? To share some ideas about how we can support our venues and the artists that we love to go and see in there. Um, the Musicians Union who are doing amazing work and help musicians are also doing some amazing work with hardship funds, but um, that's gonna only go so far, I guess. Um, if you can support your local venues, whether that's actually going to some events that are going to, that are going to start again, um, if they're being done safely, do that. Um, if not, look for fundraisers and stuff because uh, yeah, it's quite dire and uh, <laughs> and uh, they need your support. So um, we're very, I'm very happy to be here. We can chat and see what we can come up with. So solidarity. Cool. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, next up um, is Andrew uh, from the National Theatre. Hi there. Um, am I on? <laughs> Great. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Andrew and um, I, uh, up until the beginning of this week, was a, um, a member of the casual workforce at the National Theatre on the South Bank. Uh, I worked there for seven years. Uh, front of house uh, which covered a multitude of roles uh, I was an usher a bartender I worked as a facilitator on children's theatre uh, community theatre uh, I worked on the tours of the building and um, uh, was involved in bits and pieces of admin from time to time uh, so it, it was a, a terrific opportunity to work Obviously, at um, uh, one of the one of the great institutions of our cultural landscape, um, the background to the to why I took the job and why it was so appealing to me, which um, and this background is important because it's um, it, 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 it it's about our cultural in, uh, ecosystem in the sense that people that such as myself who are an actor, who are a freelance, need a, a rent paying job. And so I took the job at the National Theatre because it uh, was flexible. I could give my hours uh, that I was available and then they would give me um, shifts that fitted around those hours. Now, of course, the, um, the, the downside of that is that it's zero hours. Uh, it's casual work. I wasn't a staff member. I wasn't on a contract. So I didn't have sick pay. I didn't have employment rights. Um, and when I took the job, I thought to myself, well, what's the worst that could happen? I could go away for months on end and not worry about the fact that um, it, it, that there was no problem in the sense that I could just come back and say I'm available again. Uh, as long as I didn't get ill, I was going to be all right. So um, uh, what I didn't expect was a, was a global pandemic, which would take away the, uh, take away the, um, the National Theatre from my, um, my, take away my safety net in a sense. Um, so um, for the last six months, we've been on furlough. Um, the National Theatre has got into uh, serious financial difficulty, in fact, um, because there are ongoing costs that it needs to meet during the pandemic. And now all 400 uh, casual 
casuals on its workforce have been laid off. Uh, that's around about 200 front of house staff, such as myself, and then the rest are throughout the organisation, uh, principally working backstage as crew. Um, so the situation is um, that we have no guaranteed redundancy payout. I use the, the term redundancy in um, in hyphenated, you know, what you call those things, because it's because we're not staff, we're not um, eligible for redundancy payout, but a payout that, um, that reflects our, our service. I've been there for seven years and may not get anything. Um, so uh, the, the, the downsides are quite huge, really, because obviously as an actor, there's very little work out there currently, although things are, uh, are slowly coming back to life. Um, the um I, I would like to, to to say how good it was to work at the national theater um as i've covered already I, I i worked in many departments and it really was a tremendous family feel but here we are um up against the uh the hard facts of the situation of where we're at and casual staff are are kind of just by bye bye that's it you're off um, we've um, we've also been laid off without any redundancy consultation because we're not staff even though many of us have been there for many many years I'd also like to um, mention the role of the union in all of this um, because that's an important part of of um, the situation and, and back to, it has to be said, have been working extremely hard behind the scenes and are uh, um, negotiating furiously for our employment rights, such as they are and such as they should be. Um, although it's worth noting that whilst the, the negotiations are ongoing with the National Theatre, back to feel unable to, to speak publicly about um, the situation and what they're fighting for, for fear of harming the negotiations. I've been um, part of a small group of casuals who've been working closely with Paul Valentine and the PCS at South Bank and uh, with other organisations, other cultural organisations on the protests that you may have seen along the South Bank in recent weeks. Um, Part of that protest, back to have only recently publicly felt they've been able to support us. So um, that's a, a, an interesting area, perhaps, for the discussion, is that um, they've not felt able to speak at those events, although they have turned up with flags and so forth. But really, that's, that's the situation that we find ourselves in, and um, I'm very happy to be here and and discuss possible ways forward, uh, particularly on the employment rights side of things. Thanks very much. Back to you, Paul. Cool. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, and next, we're going to go to Amanda from Historic Royal Palaces. Hi, can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so I thought I'd just sort of keep this brief. Uh, I, I know I've only got five minutes. So uh, I guess firstly, I just want to introduce myself. So my name is Amanda Walker, and uh, I was actually the first black female warden at the Tower of London. Now, I was the first black female warden at the Tower of London in 2017, so just three years ago. And I think that fact sort of perfectly illustrates the critical lack of diversity in the heritage industry. Um, so HRP, Historic Royal Palaces, is the charity that I work for. And it's a charity that is responsible for looking after six palaces of major national and historic significance. Um, so over the past three years, I worked as a warden at the Tower of London and I'm currently at Hampton Court. So some of my chief responsibilities include looking after artifacts, uh, greeting visitors, giving tours, uh, just basically being a point of contact for visitors uh, at the palaces. And um, I think another duty that's really overlooked as a warden is telling stories, stories about the palaces. Um, I think who tells these stories matters. 
and what stories we tell matter. And I think that's why it's so sad that there's such a lack of diversity within the heritage industry. Um, the majority of HRP's BAME workforce is, well, they're on the two lowest pay grades. And um, typically we have insecure fixed term contracts, or I know the last speaker was talking about zero hour contracts. They call them casuals at HRP, but I mean, let's call a spade a spade. They're zero hour contracts. Um, so I just, I guess the point of sadness or what I wanted to make you aware of was um, at HRP, it was an organizational leader in being the first in the heritage industry to announce redundancies. And as a black woman, I wish I could say that HRP was a leader in diversity and inclusion, but no, that's just wishful thinking. Um, I'm also the diversity and inclusion rep for PCS, and I know firsthand the devastating effect that these redundancies will have on HRP's BAME workforce. Um, already, we're at 12%, and we're not in jobs of uh, positions of power. We're not able to lead programs of history of diverse, um, inclusive histories. And um, yeah, it's sad that the redundancies will have a disproportionate effect on the BAME community. And I know that HRP, and I've been to several meetings with HRP, uh, like exec board on the, on the executive board level. And whilst progress has been made, uh, I feel like they are turning a blind eye to the fact that redundancies will disproportionately affect the, the black, Asian minority ethnic community. Um, I think what is lost in all of this is that these palaces are made of stone and we need people like myself, like people with, um, like other BAME staff, to tell inclusive representative histories, um, whether you're a bee feeder, whether you're in admissions, whether you're a curator, all of us, people facing redundancies, breathe life into these palaces. They are made of stone. We bring them to life. And uh, obviously PCS opposes these cuts. And uh, we think probably the best way to save our organization, because it is facing a, a dire financial situation, is for the government to come in, step in, save jobs, not just give money to construction projects that are ongoing, but to save jobs. People come to the palaces to hear stories. People come to the palaces to interact, to get an experience. And I think that that's, that's all been lost in a lot of these job cuts. So that's basically what I wanted to say. Thanks. Cool. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, and next up, we've got Joe from Beck2 and Art Workers Forum. Hello. Uh, Hello everyone. Uh, thanks to the organisers. Uh, really great event. Um, I'm uh, going to speak about two things. Uh, the first is my own redundancy. <clears throat> and the second is the Art Workers Forum. Uh, on my own redundancy, very briefly, uh, colleagues and I were spuriously self-employed and we spoke about it and joined back to Art Tax branch. <clears throat> and then as it happens, we were, we were made redundant. Um, in mid-March, which if you remember was quite a difficult, quite a difficult time. Um, and it's because we organized and because we spoke together and because we joined back to that we've um, we've able to confidently start a legal process that will that's going okay and I can't go into details, but um, my advice if you are if you are spuriously self-employed uh, and it, that's quite a lot of people in the arts speak to the people around you and join a union is the only advice I can give. But if you've got any more questions, um, hit me up uh, on Twitter or here maybe. Uh, the second thing is the Art Workers Forum, which is, uh, as we've built it, we've come to realize is, is, is what, what was called at least a shop stewards network. So a network for um, trade union activists tend to be reps. Uh, in the arts, across workplaces, across branches. Um, we don't go far beyond London yet, unfortunately, uh, but nevertheless, uh, since 2018, um, when a group of us working the arts were going to UVW and IWGB protests and recognizing the, the power uh, of workforces with, with very low density, very few people in, in trade unions, workforces that didn't tend to be considered 
um, uh, naturally um, militant as, as trade unionists uh, and uh, the power of protest too. And all of that felt very relevant to the arts, which again is very low, very low density. Um, um, and as we discovered, the employers are um, susceptible, perhaps peculiarly susceptible to protest and to bad press. Uh, 2019, we were putting on events called, the first one was, I think, Can Art Workers Organise? Um, and it turns out they can. Uh, and we met more and more people. We met more and more reps uh, together. We supported the uh, September um, youth climate strikes. And that was the first time, that was the first time when our basic idea, which is that people working in the arts are working class. And so uh, can and should join trade unions and together militate for better conditions for themselves in the workplace. Uh, I think it was 150 or 200 people came through in the art workers block and it was a kind of proof of proof of concept. And since then meeting more and more people, um, we had friends and comrades who were striking at the art schools at Goldsmiths and at the UAL colleges and we supported them. Um, we were meant to have a big party uh, for them, but then COVID happened. Um, we went online. Um, we um, looked for opportunities. There weren't many since we'd, we'd built ourselves around protests and pickets and, and kind of um, IOL educational events. Um, then with the, with the strikes uh, at, at the Tate um, against these job losses, uh, South Bank, uh, the, the, the threats there. Um, I mean, it's not, the, the question I, I guess I'll kind of uh, have to leave, leave on is uh, what role the Forum or the AWF have played in these strikes. And I think the first thing to say is they've come from the branches. It has to be the, the, it has to be the people around you that you're taking these, these kind of making these, 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 these moves with. What I think a shop stewards network can do is um, support uh, is support those things, um, and I think sometimes I don't know about these cases, but sometimes that support can be uh, decisive because the difference between a protest of, of ten and a hundred can be enormous in terms of press, in terms of how people are feeling about it. Uh, you know, the people's confidence to go into these things. Um, um, I think maybe especially in the arts, this is possibly overly subtle, but especially in the arts, these places, the Tate Modern, for example, it needs, um, it needs the public to uh, want to be there, to feel good about being there, a particular public too. It's they're, they're, of course, they're classed institutions. Um, cosmopolitan, possibly socially liberal and so on. They don't want to walk past pickets. They don't want to feel bad about going to see whoever might be exhibiting that. I think also uh, artists too. Um, just as Paul, how long have I got left? One minute. Um, okay, a slightly controversial point. Hopefully, in thirty seconds, we're not the artists' work. We're not the artists' forum. Artists, in my opinion. The vast majority of artists are just regular working people who make art on the side. But when you become a professional artist, that's your main source of income. There's something I would say unique about what you're doing. The fact that you sign work, you sign your work mainly, uh, in the majority of cases it seems, sets you apart. I'm not saying that you're not working class, I'm not saying you're not where you're from, I'm just saying as an artist, uh, it's very difficult to organize as a kind of collective industrial group. You can still protest and do all sorts of politically meaningful things, but you can't strike, in my opinion. So we're the Art Workers Forum, not, not the Artists uh, Forum. <coughs> um, uh, in the last 20 seconds, I guess, the, the, the general thing to take from this is that um, 
shop stewards networks can be effective in building in building together across workplaces branches uh, even across sectors and um, I can see in the comments um, someone's asked for a link we don't have a public persona yet but um, but we're working on it but if you are a trade union an active trade unionist in the arts possibly a rep get in contact with me or, or Sam or Paul because we're all talking together and trying to support each other in this obviously pretty difficult um, pretty dramatic period um, and finally shout out uh, the Tate Strikes amazing work <clears throat> Cool. Thanks, Joe. And actually, that's a, a, a seamless link um, because uh, our last but not least speaker um, is Christina from PCS Tate. Uh, hi there. It's Christina Petrella. I'm a PCS senior representative of Tate Commerce. I will try to be brief. Paul, stop me if I get carried away. <laughs> um, today, actually, is the 17th uh, day of strike at Tate. Um, against the 313 redundancies uh, that we had at the at Tate Enterprises, that the commercial arm of Tate. Uh, um, about two months ago, Tate announced um, 313 redundancy at Tate Enterprises and nothing helped this situation um, because we are eligible, as a Tate is eligible of the part of the 1.5 billion of rescue package of the culture sector. And in fact, they, they will receive 7 million. But uh, that did not help our situation at all, and not even the furlough scheme. Um, and uh, actually, the regarding the furlough scheme, apparently Tate is claiming that we need to be grateful that uh, we have been, uh, uh, our, 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 our pay has been top up to, to 100% during the, uh, the lockdown. Uh, but basically, even though the furlough scheme is still in place, uh, uh, the redundancy are not going to be stopped. And actually, Tate is going to use the furlough scheme to pay for our redundancy notice. All these factors um, radicalized uh, our um, members, and uh, we decide to uh, ballot for strike. The consultative ballot went uh, actually uh, almost incredible with more than 99% of uh, vote that have been uh, received back and uh, very close to maybe uh, 80%, 85% for yes or strike. And then when we did the Saturday ballot, we decided to um, go for the strike and our core demands Maybe many of you, may, maybe they might be aware already, are, uh, are centered around three core, uh, um, our, um, our dispute is based on three core demands that if the bailout money is available, must be used to save jobs. And um, if the money is not enough, then institution men must demand for more funding. And just 10% of the 7 million government bailout money must be invested to save jobs in Tate Enterprise. And the other one is that no redundancy while senior staff continue to be paid more than 100,000 um, pounds. We, um, we don't have right now, we, we said that we are on the 17th day of strike. We don't have that much time because the redundancy have been put through already. They went through. And so we have until the end of the month, more or less, to revert the decision. And um, even more so, but actually since the beginning, we were very aware that not necessarily our action would have been uh, able to stop the, the redundancies. But uh, still we decided that it was important to fight because uh, otherwise we would have been basically losing our jobs without nobody knew, nobody knew about it. So we did not want to be, uh, go down in silence. And um, in that regard, we say that we are already are, uh, in a way, we are already winning because uh, for the first time in ages, we are, uh, uh, we are very clear about, we are denouncing what's happening to us and how Tate failed to even try to save our jobs. And that is the reason in um, many artists and members and audience and even uh, former uh, employees 
are siding with us and are uh, calling on um, Tate say that this situation is not acceptable and more must be done to save so many jobs. Um, and uh, that is part of actually our um, dispute in a way, even though it was not the three initial uh, demands, is the fact that they did not even try to find other solutions. They just went on very old school. Um, we don't need those jobs anymore. Those jobs need to be cut because uh, yeah, that we were not uh, we were not fit for purpose anymore. We are the commercial branch of Tate, uh, in working in bookshops and cafe. The bookshop and they 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 decided or they predicted that the bookshops and cafe would not do that much money anymore. So that means that they were supposed to be cut. Um, and and clearly, in that uh, Tate is treating as an unavoidable collateral damage of the pandemic and like we don't belong to the culture sector, but that is not actually what is really uh, the situation. The narrative is a little bit different from that. Many of us, if not all of us, we are working class creatives or even uh, art aficionados. And, um, and the, we work at it because we need to pay our rents, but it's also, uh, we want to be, until now actually, we felt part of a community of creatives as well. And in, that is the reason my, many of our placards say we are betrayed because uh, for ages Tate said that we were one family. And uh, so all this rhetoric uh, actually was not true. And, and that was part also actually how we became radical. We decided to fight back. In a way, as many of my colleagues told, told, uh, told you before me, that uh, this is not a new scenario. Um, what happened to Tate is happening throughout the culture sector, like Satbank Center, the National Theatre, the historic Royal Palace. And that, that is the other main thing. If the situation is left untreated and unchallenged, uh, the art and culture sector, as we know it today, that is, that is not ideal, as, as Mamanda said, as a, um, the part of that is uh, diverse, but if it's not, treat, if it's not uh, challenged now, as, as even the little that we know now is, will disappear. And uh, the things that is very clear to us that this is decimation, but maybe actually the cutting of the jobs uh, is completely preventable and is a political act. And so we need, to, um, we need to fight against that as well. Because our story at the end is very similar, um, as I said, to the culture sector, but also across all sectors. That uh, is the working class, they are working class employees that are going to be made redundant from low on income background. We are also the large, uh, by large, the lowest paid and most diverse section of the state workforce. Many are women, BME, immigrant workers, and we are going to bear the brunt of this restructure. So as you can see, it's something that is in common to other um, institutions, but also to other, uh, to other sectors as well. And, um, and as I said it before, that uh, we need to be very aware that uh, how uh, our fights fit the bigger picture because just in this way, maybe we can be effective in fighting back. The other thing that I want to add finishing is um, we are on, on our 17th day of strike, nothing, uh, um, nothing uh, basically um, stopped us to do so, even uh, when they tried to divide us. For example, we were told who, who's now, who's now uh, has got a job, but who's, who don't. So uh, many of my colleagues and my, many of us are just striking out of solidarity because many of us know that they still have a job. And, it, so, and all the things that we are organizing, the protest, the, um, uh, the, the picket lines, it seems like we are very active, but the truth is uh, my membership is not made of activists. Definitely, we are not activists. Um, maybe we became, but we were not. And I think one of the first things that uh, helped this situation was the fact that 
during the lockdown, um, the union was the presence in the in uh, my membership lives even more than Tate, the management. We were having like WhatsApp groups talking about what was happening, about health and safety. We were having Zoom meetings. And then suddenly the membership went from basically double it. Right now is more than double than uh, that it was at the beginning of the lockdown. And I think the fact that we almost um, may, may managed to have a, a collective of people that regardless of the background of the political, uh, maybe backgrounds even, we came together for the, for, with the same purpose. And going forward, I think that needs to be looked at because uh, in a way, if we manage to do that, it can be done uh, again. And the other big point was the narrative. Because if we left it like this at Tate, basically Tate did not have money and that's it. There was nothing to be done. But we did not uh, left the narrative at Tate. We uh, analyzed and dissected everything that was happening and everything that was communicated to us. And then the other thing so that everybody was taking part of it. Because like, especially when um, during um, this kind of situation, like everybody can take part, like poets, creative, people, they are methodical. Everybody can take part as long as they know what they are doing. And the other and the last thing, and I conclude here, is uh, we need to recognize that in a way we are in a tipping point. And, and again, not only in the culture sector, but everywhere. In all the sector, and especially the working class is going to be it very harshly, but this pandemic, if we don't do anything. And on top of it, if we leave it to the people that are now in charge, they potentially could be sent us back to the prehistoric uh, ages. And um, yeah, I suppose we need to uh, start organizing again. Uh, and again, I said, regardless of the uh, different backgrounds, but we need to find to try reimagining life in a time that is trying to, um, to strip of it in a way they've never seen before. So definitely, um, we need to fight back. Cool, thank you so much, Christina. And uh, thanks, of course, to, to all of our guest speakers there who I'm sure as you've listened, you've seen the, the intersectional nature of uh, everyone's everyone's plight. We're all we're all facing the, the situation where these redundancies are affecting the working class. They're affecting our people of color colleagues. It's uh, it's lining the pockets of the executives. You know all these things are, that are intersecting. Whether or not you're a freelancer, or whether or not you're front of house cleaner, whatever the the theatrical ecosystem or the the cultural ecosystem, as as we often call it. Um, so we've heard now from our, our guest speakers, and as promised at the beginning of the session, we want to try and get every everyone um, in this conversation um, involved today, all our participants in this Zoom, because I'm sure as you've been listening, it might have sort of ignited a bit of fire in your belly as well to think, actually, no, this is, this is not acceptable. We're all here because we care about the arts. We want a better um, arts and, and cultural um, ecology or whatever you want to call it. Um, so what we are going to do now is we're going to utilize the, the Zoom breakout space feature um, and we're going to break into little groups and we're going to be sort of discussing um, a little bit uh, sort of the ideas in relation to fighting back against mass redundancies. Um, so we'll sort of we'll be taking sort of three steps. There's an introduction section, obviously, and, and your involvement if you are involved in, in a particular institution. We'll be talking about what are your ideas for fighting back against mass redundancies and also what do you think uh, the next practical steps um, could be. Um, but don't worry, you don't need to, to sort of remember all of that because we've created a handy Google presentation doc um, that you'll be able to open when you're, when you're in the uh, breakout rooms and it's, it's, it's open for everyone to fill in. We've made like little um, kind of like online post-it notes, which is quite fun. Um, so when you're in your breakout room, you're making your discussions someone can fill out those various post-it 
post-it notes. Bear in mind, it is all completely anonymous. So I don't so sort of feel like you need to worry about that. Um, so we'll be filling this in for the next sort of, I don't know, 25 minutes or so. Um, then we'll come back together as a group. If we've got a bit of time, we'll try and uh, sort of do a bit of feedback and maybe bring out our panelists back in. And anything that we do fill out on our Google Doc, I'm sure the, the World Transformed will be, be sharing on the, the forum space, which I'll talk a little bit about later on, or be, be sharing online as well. Um, so um, Sarah, our tech guru, um, is going to be sort of linking that Google Doc into the chat and also um, splitting us off into our breakout room. So we shall see you all in about 25 minutes time. Cool. All right, then. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that um, that session was was useful and you had lots of lots of discussions. I mean, I can see um, on the Google Doc that we, we shared with everyone that's been been well populated now and as said i'm sure that can be be shared on the forum that i'll i'll mention um in a moment um so what i want to do just for these last sort of 10 minutes is from those sessions i'll, I'll only probably be able to take like one or two people because we're so pushed for time i'm afraid sorry <laughs> um, but uh if anyone's got anything burning that they would like to to sort of perhaps vocalize to the group now and we can we can ask maybe our panelists to, to come back on as well if you could use the the classic uh raise hand function um and clara's gone bang in there for us so yeah clara um if you'd like to unmute yourself and, and make your comment that'd be great yeah sorry for jumping in but I, I think we discussed a lot of really good ideas and that was brilliant to be able to break into groups one of the things i wanted to push forward is because in a week time there's going to be this uh, protest again i mean obviously if you are in london please attend help publicize the event but if you are outside london uh, you may want to consider organizing a small solidarity protest there is only a week to build it but even if you can bring 20 30 people together in front of a local museum or cultural institution you know and be in solidarity with uh, those workers i think that'd be great we're going to try to organize one in liverpool and if anybody doesn't know where to start in their local area i'm happy to have a chat with them and i'll post my twitter account in the in the chat thanks Cool. Thank you so much, Clara. Um, and I think, Jill, did you have a hand as well? Yeah. Yeah, feel free to unmute. <laughs> I did. I took it down because it was almost the same as Clara. Our, our group spoke about unity and lack of unity across the different art sectors, the different unions working together better. Um, Tom Taylor said that there was a TUC move to get all of the unions together. Um, but other people said it was difficult to um, legally ask their unions to attend protests. So we talked of working through other organisations as well. I wondered if the World Transformed had a role to play in that, because you have all our emails for one thing. So we could maybe distribute information about like the next protest coming up, for example, to try and build for that a little bit more. Cool. Thanks, Jill. Yeah, I mean, certainly in this conversation now, we know we've got um, world transformed organisers, so they'll be all ears to that sort of thing. Um, I can see Sam Swan, for example, is doing a massive thumbs up for us all. <laughs> um, and of course, Julie's here too. Um, yeah, and also in a moment, I'll mention that this discussion will carry on on an online forum as well. So we have still got that, that capacity um, for us all to link up and, and share our links. There's been so much going on in the chat that's been been really useful as well, but perhaps people might have missed the odd thing and we can we can solidify that too. Um, being as I am conscious for time and we've got sort of five, six minutes left, I would like um, if if our speakers have got any any final final words of, of wisdom or things things to say to us, I'd definitely like to to bring them back in. Um, speakers, I'm afraid you were at the top of my screen, but it's slightly changed now when we came back from the breakout room. So I don't know if speakers, you could use the hand function as well. It might be just useful for me, so I can introduce the right person at the right time. Um, but have any of our our guest speakers got um, any sort of final thoughts that they'd like to to add? Um, I can see Joe's actually got a physical hand on the, the window. So yeah, and so's Andrew. So let's go, let's go Joe, Andrew, and then I think Julie as well. So yeah, Joe, Andrew, Julie. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, two things. Uh, the first on the legality of protests. Um, it, it, I mean, in my opinion, I think unions should 
uh, help to facilitate um, uh, workers' efforts uh, to improve their conditions, which will inevitably include protests. And there are indeed some fairly draconian laws around protests. You can't just, um, at least formally, you have to you have to ask permission for these things. But there's a new way uh around those laws um and i think if your union is telling you you can't do something uh, you need to really ask questions why that is um sometimes it is a legal issue but other times it's an issue of um lack of confidence lack of initiative lack of knowledge uh so i think that's a ultimately a political issue that, that we just have to push back against as activists and the second thing is i looked through the cards briefly and there was talk of um bringing bringing these efforts together um over the next while um uh on that you know on the south bank there have been now three protests over august that have involved several unions and several branches um what needs to happen is just more people need to need to be involved and that's partly an issue of communication from those branches and and the people around them um but it's also you know it, it, these things take time you know if if you want to do things democratically if you want to move together it's it's not it's not it doesn't take days or even weeks it takes months to build those to build those relationships um but yeah as clara said next saturday is what hopefully will be the biggest demo yet a march from the tate modern past the south bank past the national theater to um to whitehall and uh i'll leave the facebook uh event in the in the chat because i think that's something that as individuals, but especially as people in CLPs, uh, people in, in branches and unions, that's really something to bring, to come to and to bring people to. Um, and yeah, thanks again, uh, great event. Cool, thanks Joe and then uh, Andrew and then Julie. Great, um, thank you. Um, a, a really important point that came up in our breakout was the idea of shaming the institutions publicly and um, getting artists, actors, performers uh, on board to do this, I think could have a very strong impact, um, especially as the idea that art and culture should be for everyone and not just for the, um, the sort of small C conservative traditional, um, you know, dare I say it, white haired tweed wearing customers. Um, I think the idea of um, of diversity and um, and art being something that uh, everyone consumes and therefore uh, a grassroots shaming um, by by the by the artists is is a, is is a really strong idea. I don't know if I've expressed that properly, but I think there's some legs on on that one. Cool. Thanks, Andrew and uh, Julie. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to share the resource that I put in the, in the chat, which is something that we've compiled with some PCS members and some ACORN members with lots of signposting for mental health and housing, because all those issues are really interconnected. So we thought we'd just throw all that together just to give a bit of clarity. And then there's also, uh, we've, we've produced a map of arts and culture unions. Uh, with a video description so it's available at the end of that document if you want to have a look and yeah really encourage you all to go on the forum sorry if you could post the um, things so that's the document and um so you see lots of resources for very practical um things and Sarah, she could post in the forum, the, in the chat, the link to the forum. We're going to continue this discussion throughout the day. And the rest of this day of strategy at the Watch Transform is going to address where do we go from here, like aiming higher, aiming to transform the arts and culture sector in this moment, not just ask to just maintain it the way that it was, because it was already fucked up. It was already terrible for like, of representation and the share of power between classes and races was awful so yes yeah, so the rest of the day we're going to have further conversations so i really encourage you to stick around and subscribe to 
more um, events um, if you're interested. Thank you so much. That was really brilliant and really exciting to have this resource with lots of ideas as well. It's going to be really useful. Cool. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, definitely. Uh, have a look at the, the resource document. The forum link is in there as well. Um, as Julie touched on as well, we've got the whole Arts and Culture Day, and I think there are still spaces on a lot of the sessions. So if you have got time, um, check them out and please do try and contribute. And indeed, um, it's worth saying that the, the World Transformed is a month long festival. So today is the Arts and Culture Day, um, but throughout the month, um, we're looking at sort of the ways of organising. There's I just from, I mean, obviously with my, my Green Party hat on, I noticed there were some workshops about a Green New Deal, for example, um, but there's so much, there's so much, there's, there's rally workshops performances it's just an absolutely fantastic festival month um, so I do urge everyone to have a look at the website as a whole and see what interests you things are selling out or or being sort of ticked off fast so uh, do try and uh, make yourself involved um, I'm also want to just once again um, point you to sustaining the work of the, the world transformed once more obviously it, it is a, a free festival for people um, but if you do feel like you you have the capacity um, to perhaps um, donate or in ways to support um, check out the world transformed.org forward slash support and that'll give you all that that sort of um, information there <laughs> um, yeah thanks very much to, to Julie who just spoke Julie is one of the world transformed uh, cultural organizers so thanks very much for, for organizing this session julie thanks very much to sarah who's been our tech guru today and has got us into the breakout rooms as we're putting up the various links etc etc um thanks very much to amanda joe rob andrew and christina for being our our expert guest speakers as well been very 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 informative and of course broadly speaking thanks very much to the world transformed um and we hope to see you again soon thanks very much everyone cheers View the full TWT20 program and become a supporter today to help us deliver political education all year round at theworldtransformed.org.